Okay, I'm a sitter <laughs> because I want to pretend you're in my living room. Hey, can you help me move this chair out? I just wanted to get Matt freak out a little bit. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm so glad to know you. I'm, I talked here, I think, eight years ago. Does anybody remember? Was anybody here? <laughs> remember I brought Barbie? This is her cousin, Karen. <laughs> Karen is kind of an inner critic. We all have those girls. In fact, I am that girl when I go to a speaking gig. When someone starts talking, I'm like, oh, really? That's Karen, so you don't have to be doing it yourself. Okay? Okay. This is my family. Yes, there are five of our children. I've been married to Steve Schmidt from Fairview and Mennonite Brethren, so I'm welcome here. Um, I was a Baptist girl that grew up in western Kansas, went to Tabor College to play volleyball. I know. I thought they were giving me a full-ride scholarship, but, but they weren't. But I got a husband. <laughs> I was also going for that. I'm going to admit I was. Okay, so then I have this, I accepted Christ when I was in second grade. Seriously? You think you fell in love with Jesus in second grade? Okay, I'm going to give you a little story about my son when he was 17. He came up to me and he goes, Mom, I think I love my girlfriend. I'm like, oh, do you really love her? And he goes, well, I love her as much as a 17-year-old can. And that's how I loved Jesus in second grade. He called me to him, and he is going to call you to something tonight. He may call you to give a million dollars to Aroma. <laughs> he may call you to come to him. But I have no doubt that all of you were called to come here tonight. Not by your friends, but by Jesus. And that is how great he is. So I'm going to share with you, not just about me tonight, but about what he has done for me. Um, I love my children, and I love being a wife and a mama. My favorite thing, though, is being a grandma. Is that my baby? <laughs> Madison. How much time do I have, Dixie? Dixie. I've, I got 10 minutes of Maddie, and then we're going to Zoom her, okay? She's 27 months, okay. She's precious, and I adore her, and she's fun. And my name is Honey to her. I know, she can't say it yet, and I know. If she calls me Heine, I am, <laughs> I'm changing my name. But so far, it's nothing, so I'm going to stick with it. But I'm going to tell you that you read in your thing, no author, and I am. Have you bought my book yet? <laughs> no, because it's not out. Okay. I have written, but I have not been published. So it's right now, it's in my closet in a pile, feeling like a failure. It's about the enoughness of God, though. It's a subject that I am very well equipped to write about. You know why? Because I've questioned it my whole life. So I, everything went well for me until um, I was 25, and it's because I thought that I was such a good Christian. I have quite a list, and I'll share some of it with you. Like, I didn't talk bad about people. I never used swear words. I didn't even know them until I got to nursing school. That's how in a bubble I was. I didn't have sex before marriage. I came close, but I didn't. And I did all the right things. And so then I get married. I have the most precious baby. I have an amazing nursing job. And basically, it's because I was good. And God was sprinkling his blessings all over me. Well, um, my Nicholas was two months old when he quit breathing. Boom. No reason. I didn't smoke. I didn't, I, my income was at the right level. All of the reasons. I was checking all the boxes. But we ended up 
um, burying him three days later. So it was from that minute on that I go, this enoughness of God, he is not enough for me. I thought he was, now he's not. So I've spent 27 years researching the topic of who is this God? If he can do that to me, who was a good girl, what, what is he? Well, I'm so delighted that when you read my book someday, <laughs> perhaps in heaven, I don't know, but you will find that I have mined the depths and found that he is a good, good father, and he loves his children, and he will be there for his children. So I'm going to just start talking to you about, you thought this was about the enoughness of God, but it's really about the aroma. I heard because I know Tam Ratz, we were roommates in college, and I heard about this aroma coffee shop that was coming up, and Dixie's like, well, yeah, you could do that. We're going to have them there. So this is what has come around from God about the aroma of Christ. So did you know, I want to use my nursing degree, if you don't mind, I'm still paying on it. Um, in the brain, smell is directly next to emotional and memory. So the amygdala and the olfactory, very, very close to each other. What does this have to do with me? Well, we have memories and emotions that are evoked with smell. Isn't that cool? And then all the other senses are not related to memories and emotions, but they go through the thalamus. So I'm going to have a picture of some images, like dirty dishes. Oh, okay. <laughs> that picture is from some, some pictures that are going to evoke some images for you. These images pro provoke some memories. Okay, so like in my life, um, lilacs, Estee Lauder, Aqua Velva, those were my mom and dad, and that is beautiful to me. What are these images going to evoke for you? We got your dirty dishes, like you cooked shrimp the night before, and you go, let's just go make out instead. <laughs> and then you wake up, nasty. <laughs> then you got your diaper. Okay, with these pictures, can you imagine some of the emotions? Oh, yeah. You got the hair in the drain? Okay. Now you're going, Corey, don't gross us out after this expensive meal can be tight. And I'm not trying to, but what I want to show you is how those memories can be tied to a lot of um, emotion in us. We leave sim similar memories sometimes when we are angry, when we're bitter, when we're unforgiving or arrogant, selfish, hypocritical. Do you know anyone in here that smells like a dirty diaper? <laughs> Do not point to them, Andrea. <laughs> okay, the hair in the drain. That one gets me because often we go, I don't even, I smell something, but maybe it was, was it, I don't know, was it me? And it's actually something that just wafts in and out. And this could be when we have pain, when we have secrets, or even a nagging sin that keeps resurfacing. What about some of these images? This ocean. Does that make you feel contented? Uh-huh. One of you is going to win a trip to the ocean on Aroma tonight. <laughs> Matt has it. <laughs> okay, what about payway? Grateful, authentic, consistent, curious, this perfume, joyful, refreshed, truth giving, loving. And well, coffee is loving, right? Rat says coffee is love. So I'm going to talk to you about another author tonight. You're still counting yourself as an author? I am. God called me to it. He is going to bring it about. Paul, in the Bible, 
was, um, uh, was an author, but he was a follower of Christ. But before he started that, he was a persecutor of Christians. He went around killing, persecuting, bothering in every way um, Christians. So I'm thinking the Al-Qaeda bin Laden of the Bible. And then one day he met Jesus, and Jesus changed him, just like he does us. And so Paul spent the rest of his life doing a nonprofit, writing books, and then more than any other, he has changed Christianity in the first century. Now, so his, his um, letters tonight are one of the ones that I'm going to read that we're going to go over. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 to 16. This is our main verse, so soak it in. Don't be bored because the word of God is the only thing that is living and active. The rest of my stuff is blah, blah. Okay, 2 Cor 4, 2, 14 to 16. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And through us he diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one were the aroma of life, to the other, death. Unlike so many, we don't peddle the word for profit. We're not hucksters out there. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak for God with sincerity as those sent from God. So that's where we're coming tonight. Paul wrote this, and he was, mind you, shipwrecked three times, beaten, chased, hated. And, and to me, I broke my computer last night, and I kind of took that as a sign from God that I shouldn't come tonight. Because I'm like, oh, maybe it's not God's will. But then I remembered Paul, the author of so many books, shipwrecked three times and still pursued what God had for him. Um. I'm going to teach you four little ways to be an aroma tonight. I did, the first one is to be grateful. And um, Oprah, I mean, did Oprah start being grateful? I thought she did until I started reading the Bible more. <laughs> but she, she made us do the grateful journals. But in, in Phil 4.4, Philippians 4.4, another book that Paul wrote, and mind you, he was in prison while he wrote this one. He said, rejoice in the Lord. Um, what else does it say? Always. always. Just, just when I'm not in prison? No, always. Okay. I'm known as a grateful girl, very grateful about all the things. My sister, who's a nurse, diagnosed me with PFA syndrome. Have you heard of it? Polly freaking Anna. <laughs> I take it as a compliment. I do. I am grateful. I'm grateful for my things, my 2012 van that's paid for. I call it my Barbie van. Do you know I'm practically the only one who drives a van these days? I even saw a hearse that is a Dodge Caravan just like mine. <laughs> oh, why? But anyway, I'm grateful for it. I'm thankful I drive it. And I'm thankful for my stuff and my house and my kids and my people. You know what? I have a little trouble with my thankfulness. My suffering. Paul included that in with his stuff. Persevering through suffering. Romans 5.3. Is it up there? Yes. Look at it. What does it say? Read it to me, would you? Praise him for that. Would, do you believe it? I didn't believe it at 25. I didn't get it. How would I ever praise him for any suffering? I just want, and, it, and now my children are 25 and 30 and all the things, and I just want hope for them. That's all I want. I want hope and happiness. But look what comes before hope. Perseverance, character, hope, 
suffering, perseverance, character, hope. And then what? Hope does not disappoint. That is what we want for our children. That is what we want for us. Now, if you're going, oh, Corey, you're so holy and sanctified. I want to be. And I still, if you told me, will you go walk on that broken glass? I'd be like, no. Thank you. Um, I won't choose suffering. But with suffering, I always know that God is there. When I threw flowers on the grave of Nicholas, I wouldn't choose it. I, I will never choose that again. But do you know he was there? Yep. And how do I know? Because of all the past things. When my son went to the Navy when he was 18 and the van pulled away, and I wasn't ready, my other son. So I'm like, well, he's going to die too. I wasn't ready, but God was there. At 50 years old, I moved to Texas, honestly. Texans love themselves. <laughs> I love them too. But the first thing I went into a shop and it said, Texas girls are the prettiest girls. I'm like, well, where's the Oklahoma and Kansas girls shirts? <laughs> it was a hard move for us. It really was. I love it now because it's precious and I love it, but it was hard. Um, so at 50, we moved our whole family to Texas, except they didn't come because it wasn't their home. So um, God was there when one of my daughters had a suicide note written because depression had her in the depths. God was there. God was there when Lexi, got my other daughter, got her wisdom teeth out and she went septic. And she was on a ventilator and her organs shut down. And we, we didn't know the way that it would go. We know how to do the funeral and how to do all of that. And that's what I was planning on. But that wasn't God's plan for us. God healed Lexi and we got to bring her home. He was there with us that day. One thing about being grateful is that we want to learn then to be surrendered. That's another way we can be an aroma. Because in the surrendering, that is resting and laying down what you have. I have written the narrative since I was 25 of my life is going to suck. Fine. That's what I started at 25. You would have thought I would have had way more joy then. And I did, and it was fun and all the things. But I go, I am just waiting for the next thing to happen. And then when that's not good, I'm like, well, here we go again. I know how to play this game. But that is not my story. That's not the narrative that God has for me in his book or anywhere. Um, we all reach into a jar for gummies, and we're trying to find the one that best suits us and will make our life beautiful and wonderful. And are you reaching your grubby hand in there, and you got a big old thing, a handful for yourself and your children, and you're trying to pull it out, and you can't? It's because we have to let go. We have to let go and then open our hands to see what God has for us. He has such a greater plan for us. So there's more than just not knowing, but it is bending our heart and our will to trust a Savior who's bigger than us, who created us. It's trusting that for our children. With our open hands, we ungrip our hands and we live open to what God has. We are surrendered. One of my dreams, did anybody see Parenthood? Yeah, anyway, it was a great little movie about family. They were all fabulous and dysfunctional at the same time. But they would show them at the end of each episode at this long table in the backyard with no mosquitoes and lights hanging. Honestly, it was my mama porn. I'm not kidding. I would go to bed every night going, Lord, if you just give me that, I will be happy. Well... One of my daughters is in Canada. I haven't seen her for two years. She married a Canadian who I love, love all of them. Um, that, wasn't my, that wasn't what I had written, though. And I don't know if I forgot to tell her or him. I'm not sure. And one of my kids is in the Navy, and they're moving all over. They're in Mississippi right now. Um, and I have two at home. And, you know, everybody has stuff. God is helping me to go, Corey. That Don't let that be your idol. Don't be captive to that. That's little. I have more for you. 
I have more for you. And I'm going to admit, every Sunday, this, this group of two pews full of a family come in with all their kids and grandkids and all the things. And they came in this Sunday and sat in front of us. And there wasn't enough room for all of them. And I laughed. <laughs> I know. I'm embarrassed. But God again goes, Corey, don't make that your idol. Look to me. Look to me. So Jeremiah 29, 12, when we go, well, Lord, when we look to you, can we even trust you to be there? Yeah. You know 29, 11, you all have it on a shirt or hanging in your wall where um, it says, you know the plans I have for you, Corey, the plans that are for good and evil, not to, not to harm you, but to prosper you. And, and it's a delicious verse in context. But then the next part says, call upon me and pray, and I will listen If you look for me with your whole heart, you will find me. I will be found by you. And he writes that. That's a letter written to all of you in your Bible. So highlight it if you need. Tear it out and hang it up. He will listen and he will be found by us. Um, Another way that we want to have aroma is uh, being led by him. You've all had a kid possibly or seen one on TV or at Walmart where (laughs) the mother reaches for their hand and they go limp. And see, the mom makes a decision. The other one I have is a child who would always want to grab my finger, but I couldn't hold on to her. She's like, I will only come if I have my finger. I wanted to break it off. But (laughs) I lead her out into the street one day. A car starts coming. I have to grab her hand. And um, in it, I knew bigger and not let go of her. I cannot and I will not. I wasn't even concerned. I'm way bigger and stronger. And I want to tell you that she fought against that. Um, She wanted control. And it's just like I do to Jesus. But, you know, I got a call this week, and I get one about once a week from some one of the girls from church or somewhere that goes, Corey, I cannot hang on any longer. I have had it. One more thing, and I can't do it anymore. And you know what I say? Good. Good. You're not supposed to rely on your grip. Instead, the Father has a grip around you. He made you. He designed you. He created you. He knew what you would go through. He has a grip around you. Doesn't that feel great? Yeah, so the next time you go, one more thing, and I'm going to drop my basket. Drop it. A small S, you know, we talked about big S sufferings earlier, where they're all big and huge and capitalized. But a smaller S sufferings are sometimes the one that kind of kick us in the teeth. Um, I was driving home from church the other day, and my, I have another daughter who just got married. I have three daughters. And so this one just got married, and she wanted me to go look at the venue, though. This was like six months ago. And so, you know, I'm giddy. Wow, I'm going to plan the... I'm getting all the magazines. Do they have magazines? <laughs> I'm wanting all the magazines. And so she goes, I want you to drive out with us. It's about an hour and a half away out of Dallas. And we're going to look at it and plan and sketch and all the things. And I am jazzed. So we go to early church so I can go. And then Steve and I are driving ready to go. And um, I get a call from her. I'm like, where do you want me to meet you? Shall I bring the tea? What? And she goes, hey, Mom. I'm wondering if you could not come. I know. Do you see my neck? (laughs) I'm like, what? Bad connection. And um, she's like, you know, I was just wondering, we're going to just take Davis's mom. And so don't you know, I'm writing that narrative real quick. (laughs) I'm like, what? And she goes, yeah, you know, I'll try to explain to you later. Will you be okay with that? And I'm like, I'm going to talk to your dad. Okay, bye. And so I hang up. I am bawling. And so, again, this is a little S compared to some big S's. But I couldn't, I was coming undone. Um, 
tears flowing. And then one of my girlfriends from church called. We're both on our drive home. She wants to talk about the sermon. I'm like, I can't. I'm very sad now. And she goes, what I want you to do is call her back and tell her, be great, babe. You guys have a great day out there and catch up with me later. And I want you to mean it. I'm like, oh, I don't mean it. (laughs) You call her for me because I don't mean it. Okay, you know why I could do that and I mean it? Because Pam, my friend, serves the same God that I do. And we just buried her only son who died of a heart attack at 42, less than six months before. Okay, she can speak into my life because she means it. She means it, and she trusts the God that was with her that day and is with me today and is with me on my little s suffering. And again, was it painful for me? Yeah, I I cried a little bit more. (laughs) And then we got home, and then Chelsea called me later, and she goes, you know, thank you. Thank. I thought you would kind of have a fit or something. (laughs) Thank you. I'm like, me? No. (laughs) What? Think of it. God is there, and don't be led by your feelings, girls. There's a lot of you in here that I know have a lot of pain. And if you are led by your feelings, you'll go on a big adventure. But often we end up in the ditch. At least I do. I'll take you on some rides to the ditch. The next one is be like-minded, a way to have an aroma. We want you to, um, I'm going to review with you so you remember, be grateful. Be surrendered. Be like-minded. Okay, when I learned that verse back in the day, um, I thought that it meant be like-minded with my people. Like only homeschoolers hang out, only quilters, only um, people who use Botox. You know, I mean, like I thought that meant like-minded and then everybody gets along and all the things. But that verse is so much greater than that. Look what it says. Be imitators of who? Not your like-minded little circle. Be imitators of God. Do you see the difference there? Don't be like-minded of your political situation or your mask-wearing situation or non-mask-wearing. Christ wants us to diffuse one thing. And you know what that is? Truth. He wants us to diffuse the truth of him. Just be like Jesus. Again, I I was American Baptist growing up. We couldn't dance. You're not supposed to dance. It's naughty. I just found out how great it is, like just a few years ago. And now I want to make videos with my husband like everybody does, and he won't. But... I, don't, I, don't, I can't even find in the Bible where it says you're not supposed to dance. I can't find it. And someone after God's own heart danced naked. So I'm not going to go that far. But <laughs> my whole point is I want to be an imitator of Christ, not an imitator of what I hear or what I thought I heard or what I learned. You girls have a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, I will give you mine and get another one. I love new Bibles. But... One of the reasons that I want to cover my diffuser is because I get embarrassed. I don't want people to know all the things about me because I'm not perfect. You're going, really? I know. (laughs) Um, I cover it up. Like, I will not put a Jesus bumper sticker on my car. Don't ever do it to me as a surprise. I will never have it on my car. You know why? I have a little problem, what the police wrote on the ticket as, aggressive driving. (laughs) I seriously, putting a Jesus bumper sticker on my car is one of my bucket lists, because I feel like once I can do that, I'll have achieved something. (laughs) Another thing is I'm a health coach. Seriously? (laughs) I am. But reasons that I don't talk about it, even though I know it will help people feel better, that I've been able to get out of bed with my fibromyalgia, that I'm getting off sugar, um, I know I can help people feel better, but because I don't look like a Barbie or a Karen, 
I'm afraid. Isn't that crazy? And then don't get me started about Christianity. If I talk about it too much, then people are going to start judging me the way that I talked about my husband or the way that I did this. That. But don't you know, Jesus is in me. I love him more than anything, and there is nothing that can keep that diffusing going when I check in with him at the beginning of the day. The last thing is to be prepared. And now you're going, I knew you were going to make us do something. And we learned that verse, too, in, in high school with um, 1 Peter 3.15. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be ready with an answer. And so then we do drills and find your book, you know, be ready. But it says, be ready to tell about the hope that you have. And then look at the next verse. It says, with gentleness and respect. Oops. We may have forgotten that little tiny part of it. What if in preparing, God cares more about our heart being prepared to love others and tell them about the hope we have? What if? What if? I love hearing stories and wisdom, joy in people older than me that can tell me about, I'll tell you about the hope that I have. I'll tell you. But do we listen? Do we have any time to listen? Well, it sounds like some of you are um, thinking, well, that's going to take a big Instagram following to even get anybody to listen to you. It's not. We have a little circle of influence around us, just the little people around us that God brings, and that is who we um, send our aroma out to, whether it's stinky or beautiful. Um, also, we are not trying to impress that little circle. We have an audience of one. When I came here tonight, I don't feel good today. This weather makes me feel like I have the flu. So I'm like, is that again? I don't know. But my audience is an audience of one who set this up long before tonight. And so he got you to show himself to you tonight. One way that I can um, encourage you tonight is that... Jesus has all of this written in your Bible already. In Matthew 11, he says, Dear girls, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke on you and learn from me, for I am gentle and I'm humble in heart. You will find rest for your soul. Who wants that letter tonight? Me. Just one of you? Okay. <laughs> I know you do. Um, one way that we can do this and really meet him every day in our own self, in our own room, is when we wake up and we can take our temperature. The nurse in me comes out again. But um, we can say, I am. And it's okay to be honest with yourself. When I woke up this morning, I'm like, I am tired. I'm a little fussy. My body doesn't feel good. And um, we don't end there, though. If I went on about my day, that would be sad. The next part is God is. And then from what I know, because of spending time in his word, I know that he is my healer. He is um, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. He's my shepherd. He has a Holy Spirit and my comforter and my guide and my strong tower and my safety. And so all the rest of that just kind of fades away. Isn't that beautiful? We're going to do a little demonstration tonight again about you learning to be the aroma of Christ. Okay? Because we're kind of in a little hard world right now where our fists are a little clenched. Do you think? Yeah? Okay. So put in... Whatever you're thinking for yourself about fists clenched, anything that makes you fussy, hypocrites, the mask issue, those across the aisle, the vax, the no vax, anything that's filling you with stench, and clench your fists right out in front of you, everybody, all the things. You feel it even makes you fussy and mad to do it. Um, but I want you, the next time that you feel angry and fussy, 
to just try to open those hands in your lap, wherever you are, as surrender, and even put them in the shape of a C. Let me see you. We're doing a little demonstration all together for Christ. Yep. And then we can lift our holy hands to heaven, bring them together, and oh my word, we have just sent an aroma of love to heaven. Oh, I wish I had my camera to take a picture of you guys. <laughs> but we think that it takes a big old group, but it's just one of us at a time sending that to heaven. I adore you and thank you for letting me serve you tonight. It was a treat and a pleasure. And I also want to allow you the time to come to Christ if he is calling you tonight. And I'm not sure where you are. I know that just, that just my friends and myself, we have some pain and crazy and sadness and tiring going. But God is calling you to come. Come to me if you are weary and heavy laden, if you're tired of what's going on. And he has more for you than what you have. So we would like some girls to come forward. And any of the girls come forward that we're going to pray? Mm-hmm. We are here in our tiny little living room again without any eyes on you. We're all in our own little place. We're all in our own little time. And, and we have gathered friends among you or even the girls that you came with. And we would love you to be able to have some people to pray with or talk to if there's anyone that you um, want to share something with or... Um, uh, just spend some time with the Lord in prayer, okay? So I would like to pray, and then these girls are available if you guys would like to talk to them. Lord, we are so, so thankful that you show up. Lord, you do what you do best. You show up for each of us, for our hearts. You give us what we need. We love you so much. Thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die for us. Thank you that we can do, Lord. There's not enough good that we can do. There's not enough good that we can do, Lord, but you sent Jesus and paid that whole price for us. We love you so much. We trust you with our lives. We bring them to you tonight with open hands and hand them to you. And, Lord, we open our hearts, and we ask that you will um, call us to you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.